Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is my buddy Dave Jakes. He's going to share personal stories about the 25 years he spent playing bass with John Prine. I mean, I can't think of anything bad to, that I could say about John, and I rode around in cars with him for 25 years. He was just such a special person. He was just such a regular guy. Like, I think he just, he treated people the way he thought people should be treated, you know? John traveled. I mean, the road was kind of like home for him, you know, in a way. You know, that's he'd done it for so many years. He had it down. Uh, we'd play weekends. He always made more money on the weekends. He didn't have to worry about filling a house on a Tuesday night, which he probably would anyway. But he liked playing weekends. I think he liked, especially when the, when he had, when the kids were young. You know, in fact, you'd go out, play Friday, Saturday, be home Sunday. And it was great for me because I could still work in Nashville. I mean, I still could do sessions and, and stuff. It was like. Not really gone. I'm gone Friday, Saturday, and I'm coming home Sunday. And then if we went out west or Canada or Europe, you know, it'd be longer runs. But mostly it was three-day runs. And um, it was just brilliant. It was such a small organization uh, that it was easy to just fly people somewhere and get rental cars. No bus, no truck. Oh, well, actually, there was a truck. A lot of times we'd have a truck where the crew guys would drive the gear. So, which was great, because then we'd always have our gear, even though we're, I didn't have to fly with it. Never had to fly. I'd go to the airport with a carry-on bag and my backpack and just get on the plane to wherever. I said, my commute is to the airport. And I just get on the plane to wherever it's going and then fly home on Sunday. It was, yeah, that was great. And so he had it down to a, a, a it was just so great touring with him. But he took everything like he had. It didn't matter if we were going someplace for three weeks or two days. He carried the same stuff like he had the same bags and always had a couple of suit bags, always overpacked. But, you know, you never know what you're going to need. So he never had to think about what he what he needed because it was all in there. And so he had, there were certain food things he liked, pancake syrup and ketchup and, you know, just stuff that he liked to have and didn't want to rely on other people, you know, making sure somebody else had it. So he traveled with it because he could. You know, there would be times where the, we'd be checking his bags, you know, we'd be with him. And, um, and he always flew first class. And so he, uh, you know, he got a little leeway on stuff. But, you know, like he'd have this giant bag that was overweight and the people behind the counter would be like, uh, OK, well, if you just took like one thing out of this bag and put it in this other bag, you know, no, I just want to pay. I, you know, like he was he was fine about paying. John was was great about not caring about that stuff, you know, and uh so his tour manager was always, you know, trying to save every dime he could. And then John would just be like throwing it out the window. It was great. And so, uh, so you know, it would be like, okay, you'd save like $75 if you just moved one thing from here. No, uh, just, I'm not going to do it. You know, like, like, could you explain to this woman that I'm not going to take something out of this bag and put it in the other bag? I'm not going to do it. I just want to pay, you know? Anyway, uh, he was funny that way. And he was a great tipper, you know, not to get sidetracked on this, but uh, like sometimes Jason and I would be like, the, the car would be valeted and, and uh, we'd come down and the valet would be there with the car, you know, because we would have called down for it. And Jason and I would be like, you don't want to give the keys to us. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> if you want a good tip, wait for our boss to come down. Yeah, here we go. Yeah, you want to wait for our boss. You want to hand the keys to our boss. <laughs> <laughs> and it is great. There's so many, there's so much stuff about John like that because he was just that guy, you know, that was like, he's just such a regular guy. 
I remember like when uh, the whole you know tarp thing it, when the the banks collapsed and they did they had all this money they were trying to get the economy going and and stuff and John John was like I know how to how to get the economy going and he goes if they just give it to me I'll spend it. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, and it was kind of true. Yeah, so you know he lived um, he lived well. You know he he liked cars and stuff, and he had a nice house and stuff. And and then the his last house was really nice, but mostly he he didn't need fancy stuff. You know, Jason and I have talked about this. Is one of the reasons we have so many stories about John uh, that maybe other people have toured around don't have stories about the artists they work with is because we rode in a car with them every day. You know, like we weren't on a bus sleeping or stuff. We were, we'd get up and of course, you know, we'd never leave before noon. Like there was no, there was no like, oh, we're leaving at 10. No. (laughs) John slept. John, I think I always thought about this was uh, because I noticed like when I first started playing with him, like if you saw John in the lobby at like uh, one in the afternoon at the hotel, this is when we we're on the bus. If like I ran into John in the lobby, it was because he was going to get breakfast, you know. So he kind of like would adjust when he hit the road. He would almost like adjust his schedule so that the show was more in the middle of his day, you know. So the show wasn't the last thing he did before he went to sleep. He would eat dinner after the show, go back to his room, hang out, watch TV, you know, go to bed, at, go to sleep at four or something and get up late. And I thought, you know, it's that thing when you see uh, artists who have really got it dialed in, you know, and he could do that because he was, you know, he was John Fry. <laughs> he could do whatever he wanted. And uh, so... Uh, but, you know, to see that so that way the show, you know, it wasn't at the end of his day. It was in the middle of his day, kind of, you know, not not like dead center. But but it was like it was not, you know, the at the end of his day. He was such a great I mean, his artistry on stage was so great. You know, never saw him. I never saw him blow through a song, you know, like every time he sang it a song it was he was in the song you know like it, it, he just I never saw him just like blow through it and because of that it was always you know you had to be really present and especially the trio thing it was so exposed like everything you did you know there's that thing about uh, taste and time and you know uh, that it's that's all it was you know so every note every night it was like you know every note you play you wanted to play them just just right you know like you know it was uh it was great it was a really great experience never never got tired of playing those songs no i'd never met him i I've been places where he was, you know, like I'd be at this old sutler or something. I turn around, I was like, whoa, that's John Prine, you know. And um, and I had played a gig that I know he saw me at. I played with R.B. Morris. I don't know if you know R.B., but um, I played with R.B. for a, a while, quite a while. And uh, we opened for Lucinda Williams at the Bluebird. So that puts any perspective on what was happening at the time. But so we were at the Bluebird and we opened and it was packed, but John was there. So that's the only time I know for a fact that he saw me play. Um, And so I uh, used to play with Ray Kennedy. I don't know if you're familiar with Ray, but Ray was a country artist in the early 90s and um, had a top five single with uh, What a Way to Go. Women gonna be the death of me, but what a way to go. Anyway, so I played with Ray. And so this was probably 92, maybe I played with him. I can't remember, 91, 92. But I hadn't seen Ray in a long time. And Ray kind of called me out of the blue because he was producing 
you know, he became a producer and studio owner. And so he was uh, producing somebody, he was doing a showcase and he needed a bass player. And the drummer, who I think was Rick Shell, recommended me. He said, oh, you should call Dave Jakes. And Ray was like, oh yeah, Dave Jakes. And he calls me up, can you do this session, the, the showcase? I'm like, sure, you know, talk to him for a little bit because I hadn't talked to him in probably two years. The next day, Ray runs into Al Bonetta, John's manager. Al says, John's putting a band together. You got any bass players you can recommend? It's like, Dave Jakes. You know, it's like, because I had just talked to him. Had I not, you know, that was just luck. That was some dumb luck right there. I auditioned at the same time as David Steele, I remember. Two of us playing, and and um, so he already had Phil Parlapiano had was the keyboard player on the Missing Years tour, the Brothers Figaro, him and Bill Bonk and Dwayne Jarvis did that that tour. So Phil was the band leader. Uh, John had run into Larry Crane, who was Mellencamp's guitar player forever. You know, like they went to junior high together. They'd known each other, and they would had a falling out, and so. Um, uh, that's how we met David Steele. He ran into Larry Crane, who we'd met through Mellencamp, Dave, the Sutler. They were sitting, Larry Crane and David Steele were sitting at the bar at the Sutler. And um, John saw Larry, he goes, hey, I'm putting a band together, you know, I need a, a couple of guitar players. And Larry was like, well, here you go. It's two guitar players right here. <laughs> and so so Larry had the gig. Larry, John said, okay, if you wanted to do it, you know. And, and so Steele auditioned, and he ended up getting the gig. So I auditioned. I thought it went really well. I thought it went well. And um, he goes, uh, yeah, he goes, uh, there's one other bass player I, I promised I'd listen to. He goes, uh, but I'm going to Ireland for a month. So it's like I audition. I think it goes well. And, but John's leaving. He's going to Ireland for a month. Then he's going to listen to this other bass player. And I thought, OK, you know, I didn't know what to do. And I remember being at 12th and Porter. And I can't remember who I was playing with, like maybe Jeff Finland or something. I don't. Anyway, so I'm playing with him. And I, do you know Doug Lancio at all? Who's Doug's playing guitar with um, Dylan right now, but he played with uh, Patty Griffin for a long time and produced um, A Thousand Kisses. And, and he's a great guitar player, but a Nashville guy. Like he uh, he grew up here. Anyway, but I didn't really know Doug at the time since, you know, I've since toured with him and stuff. But I'm standing there and uh, talking to, I think it was Finland, and I don't know who else was there. But Lancio was sitting, standing there, and he goes, uh, uh, I was talking about it and didn't know Doug, really. I said, uh, God, I feel good about it, but I guess I have to just, you know, book gigs like I don't have, like I didn't get it. Because, I don't know, I can't plan on having it. And Lancio goes, oh, you got that gig. You're perfect for that gig. And he walked away. Like he said that and walked away. And I thought, I don't even know that guy. <laughs> it's like, <laughs> how does he know? But, you know, anyway, Prime called me like a month later. And he said, yeah, he goes, yeah, yeah, I was thinking you, you have the gig. But I promised this other guy I'd listen to. Anyway, so that's how I ended up with the gig. When uh, we started, John hadn't had a full band in years. So he had to put a full band together for the missing, for the uh, Lost Dogs tour. And production, you know, like was lighting guy, there was backdrop, there was all the stuff. So um, there was like an 18-wheeler and a tour bus, which John really never got on. Maybe once or twice he rode the tour bus. Oh, John, this is something about John that was uh, kind of great, is that if you could drive, John didn't like the overnight thing. He liked to go back to his hotel room and sleep in the hotel room, get up the next day, and he would fly. Or uh, if it was drivable, he would drive. And then some of us, you know, like... Once we did, we're doing a little bit. If it's a was a drive, you know, like the tour manager would go, why don't you guys drive ride with John, or somebody should ride with John. You know, Phil would ride with John a lot if it was a drive, and then I would do it sometimes and steal. In the latter years, when it was me and Jason and John, and we had serious, he'd always want to get a rental car with Sirius Radio, 
so he could listen to Cowboy Jack Clement's show on Outlaw Country on Saturdays. That's every Saturday. Because we drive, in those years, we would play, mostly play Friday, Saturday. Like we'd fly to a city when it was just the, the three of us playing, because it was, you know, the crew would travel separately. And uh, so me and Jason and John would just ride in the car and get a rental car in whatever city we start in. They'd book it so it was two cities you could drive, drive, but far enough apart that it would be different markets. You know, like two, two hour, three hour drive. And so we'd, uh, the three of us would get in the car on uh, Saturday, car with Sirius, had to have Sirius, like if the, the tour manager knew that it was supposed to have Sirius radio so that we could listen to Cowboy Jack Clement's show. The story, as I recall, um, is that Steve Earle had offered Steele the gig. He'd heard Steele play and wanted him in his band, but Steve wasn't touring at the time. So that was before he got the prime gig. So he gets the prime gig. He does that. We're taking like a two or three months off. And um, Steve Earle calls Steele up and it's like, you know, you want to go on the road. And Steele takes the gig. So he calls, he has to call Alvin at, uh, you know, I don't know if he talked to John about it. But, but uh, anyway, so he takes the gig. But he goes, uh, you know, I've got a guy that's, that'd be really great for the gig. He recommends Jason Wilbur for the gig. And these guys are all buddies. They played in bands together up in Bloomington and stuff. So they'd known each other a long time. But Larry Crane knew Jason, you know, so he was familiar with with Jason and Larry's like, yeah, because John talked to Larry about it too, because they're all, you know, it's the, the Southern Indiana boys. And so they all know, knew each other. And uh, I didn't know if Larry really knew Jason, but he knew who he was and he'd seen him play and he said, yeah, he'd be good. And so instead of auditioning guitar players in Nashville, John decides we're going to go listen to Jason. So he comes over to my house and picks me up at my house in his car to, and we drive to Bloomington because the Larry's up there, Larry Crane's up there. The drummer is from Indianapolis. And so it's just me and John and, um, and Phil Parlapiano, we had to fly in. So he, they just flew him to Indianapolis instead of flying him to Nashville. So John, picks me up at the house and we drive, start driving a little bit. And uh, he goes, I can't believe we're driving to Bloomington. We live in Nashville. And we're driving to Bloomington to listen to a guitar player. And he drives, drives just a little further and he goes, this guy better be good. <laughs> <laughs> so I just remember that. So but yeah, we drive up there and, um, and uh, Steele had coached Jason on the set, you know, like he went through the set, what parts he, he played, you know, so Jason didn't have to figure out what Larry's playing, what's Steele playing, you know, and what, and what Steele was singing, what parts he sang and, and stuff. So Jason knew the show. So we went up there and just played this, played the show, ran through two hours of it and and the funny thing is, is I think the where we did it was like a block from Jason's house. Yeah. Like, I think Jason walked over <laughs> to audition for John. So uh, anyway, that's, as I recall, that's, that was the, how Jason ended up in the band. So when Jason gets the gig, we went out on a five-week run, which is the longest run we ever did. You know, it was the last run the... Lost Dogs Band did. We went out. It was a great tour. So Jason's, so this was Jason's first gig was, um, oh, the ballroom in Tulsa. Um, Canes. Canes, yeah. That was the first gig Jason did. We played Canes and then went down and probably played, I don't, you know, probably played Austin and don't know where. But then we played um, in Santa Rosa, and I remember, I think it was the same night that Tom Waits and Bonnie Raitt came out to the show, Tom and his wife. And um, John always ate after the show. The only time he, I ever heard him go out 
to dinner before a show was that night where he went and had dinner with Bonnie and Tom and his, his wife. And that was incredible. I've never got to see Tom Waits play, but I've been on stage with him. <laughs> he came out and sang Paradise, he and Bonnie both. Bonnie Ray kissed me on the cheek. Like, I mean, it's like, okay. <laughs> that's, that's, you know, what more do I need to say? It was like, oh my God. Like she, you know, I met her and she kissed me on the cheek. It's like, all right. My life is complete. I don't know. <laughs> but anyway, Tom was there and he was so complimentary. It was just, uh, just such a pleasure just to meet him and stand around him for a few minutes, you know. And um, they came out and sang on Paradise. It was really, uh, that was a pretty special night. At this point, we kind of knew that this was the last run for this band because John had a European tour and he couldn't take the whole band. It wasn't cost effective or, you know, and so he was going to whittle the band down. And so I think it was that same night in Santa Rosa, because that was the dressing room for sure. So it had to be the same that same night. He gets us all in the room, the, his dressing room and breaks the news. <laughs> you know, like who's who's going, who's who's leaving. So Phil, of course, was the band leader. He stayed. And then uh, Jason stayed, and because um, Larry had, you know, he had his own thing going and stuff, and I think that was John's justification. And uh, and then I, I was the third one. And Phil said it was talked about. They thought about keeping the drummer as deaf percussion, like the keys, guitar, and percussion. But I got the. I made the cut. <laughs> <laughs> and the, the funny thing, you know, when I got the gig, when I first got the gig, I'd been in Nashville, you know, probably just long enough, five or six years, where I'd been through some cycle. You kind of see the cycle, you know, you get hired for a gig, you do some touring, then, uh, you know, then you have to find another gig, you know, kind of cycles. And when I got the gig with John, I thought, oh, Oh, this would be good. This will last like a year, a year and a half. So that was what I thought in my head when I got the gig. And I did it for 25 years. So I started with him basically at the halfway point in his career. I you talk about the audience a little bit because he's one of those artists that people really connect with on a personal level as a listener. Yeah, and I think part of that is um, that... He's one of the artists that if you know the, know the the his songs, you kind of know him, you know, in that way that's different than a, some artists, you know, because he can, uh, you know, I used to think he used to do Sam Stone. Oh, no, it's the other way around. He would do Space Monkey. Do you know the song Space Monkey? With Peter Case. Yeah, he wrote it with Peter. And, um, and so... Uh, he would do Space Monkey and follow it with Sam Stone. And I thought, who could pull that off? You know, because, but both those songs are him. You know, they're both, there's, there's, there's the goofy, silly side, and there's this side of him that could see into people's lives, like, you know, see the, the details and stuff that, and, and bring, you know, those lives alive you know like so people I think that's one of the reasons that people could connect with John so much that, that it was all him you know he could be the goofy guy he was the the uh you know but he could do that really serious stuff and and he could do one right after the other and it never seemed odd like it didn't seem odd that he was singing about a, a monkey that the <laughs> Russian <laughs> shot into space. And then, you know, like four minutes later, he's singing about uh, a guy who comes coming back from Vietnam and his life is shit. <laughs> you know, like, I remember a friend of mine who had never seen John saying, because, well, you know, there was all that, always the people and friends who had never seen him who would come see him and go, 
how do I not know about this guy? You know, like this, that, that thing. And uh, because there was always, I used to think there's two kinds of people, people who love John and people who don't know about John. You know, and that's pretty much <laughs> it's like there's two kinds of people. <laughs> and uh, I remember a friend of mine was saying, you know, it's like an it's a, like an emotional roller coaster. You know, watching John's show because you know you're laughing one second and you're crying the next. People kind of knew that if they hung around long enough, um, they might get to meet John. And it didn't happen all the time, you know, because of scheduling. But he would. Uh, eat dinner after the show. And so he would finish the show, go back to his dressing room and eat his dinner. And and I think, uh, you know, that was another thing about him having having it dialed in. He'd go back to the dressing room and no one would bother him when he was eating. Like he'd go in there, have some time to himself, be able to sit down, enjoy his dinner. That was not a time where people went and hung out and stuff. And so he had that time to, like, relax after the show, where he'd go, you know, sit down and eat. Then if you hung out long enough, <laughs> like, like, so you had, to, you had to put in some time to, if you wanted to meet John. Because then if there were people with uh, guests, you know, John would meet with guests after that, people have passes. Then if you had hung out long enough, you might, you know, there was a good chance you'd get to meet John. Yeah, and so he used to do that pretty much every night. And then um, in the latter years, you know, he, as he got older, it kind of took a, more of a toll on him. To, and then by the end, by the very end, like the last year or, uh, I don't know when he started doing this, but at one point he would walk off the stage and get in the car and leave. Well, people were still, you know, like, still like clapping. And they would walk off the stage, everything would be ready for him, and his food would be in the car, and then he'd just eat back in the hotel room. But that was, uh, he, he kind of switched it around at a, at a certain point. I don't remember when that became it, but it's like, John has left the building. Well, eating on the road, you know, which we did every, every Saturday, because we would be driving. We'd usually, we'd, we'd eat at mom and pop places sometimes, you know, if we could find a good one, uh, that's what we'd do. But we ended up, our fallback was always Dairy Queen. A Dairy Queen grill and chill specifically is the, what you're looking for once they started, because they had a good burger. We'd go there, John would get a burger, milkshake, Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> this was, um, you know, like the last, probably last five years. I can't remember. Like the time is a little iffy, but like Fiona was, came out on the road with us the last few years, which was great because it kept John. At this point, you know, like John's, uh, the things John shouldn't be doing are not like, you know, things you think of like people out on the road doing. It was more like, eating a Sunday at lunch. Like, you don't need to be doing that. <laughs> you know, like, stuff like that. I remember Fats Kaplan, when he got in the band, like the first time he rode with John, so Fiona's in the car and John and Fats, and maybe Jason. I wasn't on this trip, but but uh, they stopped at a Dairy Queen and Fats was had never eaten at one. And so Fats maybe had never eaten fast food, I don't know. But uh, so they're getting out of the, the car, and Fats says to Fiona, um, so what's good at this place? And Fiona said, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> so anyway, it's just a matter of opinion, I guess. So we'd eat places like that. On John loved nights off on the road. Uh, John... By the time I started playing with him, I guess not so much in the Lost Dogs days, but uh, I guess it was after his first cancer surgery. He started, he would only do two nights in a row. He might have done that, started that earlier, but I can't remember. But at a certain point, he said instead of booking, he wouldn't do three nights. He'd do two nights. So if you were out more than two nights, there was a night off. 
So we could never do Thursday, Friday, Saturday. It would be Wednesday night off, Friday, Saturday, or Wednesday, Thursday night off, Saturday. So there'd be a night off, and John loved to go out to dinner. And we'd all go out to dinner with John. We ate at great restaurants. When it was as small, when it was just me and Jason and John, like we'd always all go in the crew. And, you know, John was, John was good about including everybody. You know, like the crew guys were, would always be there and the, and the tour manager who had been with John forever. He was there. Actually, he was there longer than me. He'd already been with John for six years or something when I got the gig. Mitchell Drosen, who's a he could, great tour manager. He could probably not be noticed in a lot of these restaurants, too, wouldn't it? Oh, yeah, that's the thing about John. Another thing, John could just go places like where other people wouldn't be able to. And so he could go out and get the newspaper or go out and go shopping or stuff. And, and every once in a while, somebody might recognize him. But, uh, you know, people didn't really bother him. You know, I don't think... It's kind of the perfect career, isn't it? Yeah, that he was able to play theaters. Like, he never got to the, you know, the arena, you know, like, but that's not a good place to play music anyway. We did one arena show. We opened for Sting one time. And I think it was because Sting wanted us to, but wanted John to. I think it was Albuquerque we opened for him, and it was like, <laughs> And it wasn't the full band, you know. I think Phil Paolo Piano was still in the band, so it was, uh, you know, like me, Jason, Phil, and John were playing for 15,000 people, which we played for bigger crowds. I mean, someplace like the Edmonton Folk Festival, you know, you play for 80,000 people, but those are 80,000 people who are want to see John, you know, we were playing for 15,000 people who wanted to see Sting and <laughs> we happened to be there. So I don't know. That was a, it was a strange experience. People loved John so much. Anytime we played, we, everybody else on stage would just get some of the love that bounced off John because it'd just be so much, <laughs> you know, it, but uh, it was, it's kind of funny because those big crowds, you don't really see anybody past the first few rows at, at night anyway. Dave Olney, this is a side story, but we played the Philadelphia Folk Festival, and I remember Dave Olney was there. There was uh, like a kind of reception thing at the hotel afterwards, and I'm standing there talking to Dave, and he starts telling me about the crowd. He goes like, so it's this ragtag bunch of people you know, spread over this hill at the f festival. And he said, it, when John came out, he goes, it's like, he gave all these people dignity. And I thought, wow. You know, like he said, all of a sudden, this crowd just seemed to, like there's, there's some kind of lift to this whole group of people that are just like spread out on blankets and stuff all over the hill. And, and John came out. It's like he gave him dignity. I thought, wow. Dave only had a way with words. <laughs> yeah. I remember Fred Willard came to see us in Ventura, California. That was a big thrill for me because I'd, of course, everybody knew, knew him from Spinal Tap, but I'd watch Fernwood Tonight. I don't know if you remember that show with Martin Mull, and he was the sidekick, and that was brilliant. That show was brilliant. So anyway, that was a big thrill for me. Jerry of Ben and Jerry's. <laughs> like there's certain people where I go, like that guy, okay, he's, that was cool. And he goes, he brought ice cream. He goes, people expect me to bring ice cream everywhere I go. <laughs> so, and this was back in the day, you know, before uh, they'd sold to Unilever or whatever, the giant corporation had owned some now. Stephen King came to see us one time, and we're all standing there. And, and uh, this was when Stephen had the band. He was... He had a band, I forget who else was in it, but some other like literary people or something. I don't remember much about it. But that's what John asked Stephen about. Like Stephen King's there in Portland, Maine, and John asked him about the band. <laughs> so that was good. Chips Moman, who started, you know, Stacks. And, and um, Chips, I remember meeting Chips because we were in Macon after his show. We, we're in the basement, this big room in the basement of the theater. 
And he comes over to me and Jason and he goes, hey, can I get a picture with you guys? And I was like, yes. <laughs> if you can, can we get a picture with you? Anyway, that was one of those weird, really weird things. Can I get a picture with you guys? Like you. And then Jason said, uh, oh, that's funny. I didn't think of you as a uh, Macon guy. He goes, oh, yeah, yeah, this, this is where I'm from. He, from but he, then he starts going, yeah, I'd moved to... Memphis, and I started this little label at some point, like talking to us like we have no idea who he is. You know, anyway, it was pretty funny. Um, was he involved in John's first album? I know that was like Reggie Young and... Uh, possibly. It was Reggie Young's birthday, by the way. Oh, is it really? Oh, he was a sweetheart. Yeah. I got to, I've got a Reggie Young... I got to play on, a, on one record with Reggie. But um, Donnie Fritz... So Donnie uh, Fritz was recording a record, I think, at Gary Nicholson's house, his studio's house. And so he hires John to play guitar on, one, on song. He's recording All This Baby in the World, which they wrote together. John was excited because it's like, you know, I've never been hired to play guitar <laughs> on a session. <laughs> It's so, so he's just there to play guitar, but we get there, uh, and John got me on it, I, I guess, you know, like, I don't know why I was there, but, uh, I played bass on the track. And so, um, we get there and Reggie's there and, uh, he's got a guitar, he's overdubbing some stuff on, on another track. And, and so he's there and they start talking and Reggie, they start talking about the record, the first record and Reggie goes... He goes, yeah. He goes, same guitar. Like, this guitar I played on your record. And this was, uh, you know, whatever. I don't know how many years later. And then he turns around and he goes, same amp. <laughs> <laughs> and I thought, that's pretty cool. Yeah. We heard stories about Steve, Steve Goodman all the time. You know, they were really close buddies. And I never got to meet Steve. I never got to see Steve play. Never got to see a Steve Goodman gig. But uh, just, you know, on TV. So there were stories about, you know, that you'd always hear about him and Stevie and, and, uh, and Al Bonetta. Like back in the day, the three of them, I think, were pretty tight and maybe did some wild stuff, you know, back in the day, the wild days. By the time I missed the, the, I missed the wild times because, you know, he and Fiona... We're together when I got the gig, so I missed. There was the thing about John, you know, like you'd hear stories. Before I ever knew him or met him, you know, like the, he always used to do the Christmas show, like he did a Christmas show, the whole damn family. I don't know if you know about that. but have been to it many times. Okay. So uh, he did do a Christmas show and be Jim Rooney and Cowboy Jack Clement would be there and uh, Roy Husky Jr. played bass. And uh, it was just incredible but I never it would be one of those things that I'd always hear about the day after it happened you know like I'd run into people oh yeah I went to John Bryan's Christmas thing last night it's like <laughs> how do I not know about these things you know I'd always hear about it and it would be the little club down in, in Green Hills you know in the old days did you see it back then? I saw it at the station a few times yeah yeah they moved to the station but it used to be at a place called the end zone I think it was a sports bar and they do it in the back room. And it really low ceiling. It was funky. But it was, I don't know why they did it there, but that's where they did it every year. And um, till they finally uh, moved to the station in. Anyway, that was one of those things. But same thing, you'd, you know, I'd hear about people, oh, yeah, I was at John Prine's house last night at four in the morning. You know, it would be like the missing years, I guess, that, that period where, uh, you know, John was single and, Back in that time period where, I don't know if you know the story about the train, where they went out and bought a train set and nailed it to the kitchen table, because he could. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, so, I mean, he was that kind of guy. He's a big kid. He never lost that. He never lost the kid part, you know, which I think a lot of artists are that way. I kind of feel like. I hopefully um, I fall into that category. But that, that was the kind of thing, you know, like I'd run into people like, yeah, John was cooking, you know, 
ribs at like four in the morning and ended up at his house. Cause see, I guess people just said, you know, like be hanging out at the bluebird or something. And everyone would go over to John's house for drinks and then he'd make some food. And it's a pretty good story. But, um, John, uh, I remember John telling us this, that this is one of those things, you know, because you're in the car with John all the time, you get to hear the, all these stories. And, and so John had been down in Florida, in a house in Florida and, uh, and with Fiona and Van is is there is playing a show and so he gets tickets to the show Van Morrison yeah Van Morrison and so uh, they go see the show Van hears that John is there and wants John to come backstage and John said yeah he goes you know there's that thing about meeting your heroes he goes I was a little like I'm not sure I want to go back because, you know. But anyway, so John had trepidations about going back to meet Van. But he, he thinks, uh, yeah, okay, all right, let's go. And so they go back and they meet him and it, it's great. It's all great. You know, Van's life is there and, and they're, they're all getting along great. And so Van says, well, let's have lunch tomorrow. You know, come over to the hotel, we'll have lunch. And so they go over and John said, it's all, it's all going great. And then... Uh, uh, they'd had lunch and just kind of hanging out. And John uh, had asked Van a question about a song, and I don't know what what song, um, but it was one of the songs that came out on Bang Records. And uh, he asked the question, and he said it was like this big dark cloud came over Van, and Van's wife leans over and says, "That's kind of a bone of contention." <laughs> so, anyway, and then he said, like, lunch was over. That was about it. <laughs> it was like the end of lunch. <laughs> it's a little bit of a bone of contention. And so there was that thing, like, one of the phrases like that, you know, because you're on the road with the, the same people for so long, like me and Jason and John. There was, like, all these, like, punchlines and lines like that that um, would just come up. You know, like we'd say them and we'd all know where they came from because it was always just the three of us, you know, like we'd, we'd be something, something, you know, like reading something in the paper, see something on t- TV. I mean, one of us would go, that's a bit of a bone of contention. <laughs> like it's one of those <laughs> lines that became like, a, like one of the inside, inside jokes. You know, there were a bunch of those over the years. You know, so there was the band for a little while with Pat McLaughlin. So it was me and Jason and John. And then after Fair and Square came out, when Fair and Square came out, uh, John asked Pat to, if he wanted to come out on the road. And so Pat did it for a little while then, and then I think he didn't do it for a little while, and then came back maybe. I'm a little fuzzy on all these details. Uh, but then at one point... John sees Kenneth Blevins play, and Kenneth, you know, played has played with Hyatt since Bring the Family came out. Anyway, John sees Blevins playing, I think with Pat at Douglas Corner, and he's like, okay, I want this guy to play drums, you know, in the band. And so um, he asks him, and he goes, well, you know, I've, I've been with Hyatt. He goes, well, just, you know, just do it when you can. You know, and and so Blevins starts playing with us with Pat, and then eventually Pat's like, I can't keep doing it. Not for any reason other than Pat had other stuff to do. You know, he realized he'd gone a, a, over a year without playing one of his own gigs, and I think that was part of it. It's like, okay, I'm neglecting my thing, but Pat, of course, they wrote incredible. They wrote so many incredible songs together. I mean, Summer's End is like, uh, it just still blows my mind. How what a great song that is! But and that's a whole list of songs Pat and John wrote that are incredible. You know, it's so great. John got to do like the victory lap. You know, because uh, Tree of Forgiveness comes out, and it was like his biggest record ever, and the tour was it was great. It was really great, all great. And so we go. We went over to Europe, 
and John had been having uh, uh, some problems with his leg, you know, and it's, he told us the first time he'd, he'd already had, he'd had a hip replacement once before, but he, he said, uh, yeah, he goes, you know, like you go to the, uh, my, my back's hurting me and stuff, you know, and he's having trouble. He goes, you, you go to the knee doctor and they say, well, it's your knee. And he goes, you go to the back doctor. Oh, it's your back, you know? <laughs> and so finally they figure out it's his hip. And so, uh, he had a hip replacement. I don't know what year that was. But so he's having kind of the same symptoms, you know, he's having trouble getting around. And um, and it was the same, I think he was going through the same kind of thing with the doctors, you know, like. And so finally he goes, he goes, has to go out, um, goes out to L.A. because he gets the Grammy. But he's having some issues. And from there, he goes to Ireland, you know, because he had a house in Ireland. So he's in Ireland for a week. While he's in Ireland, I think that's when he gets an MRI done on his hip. Then he meets us in Yevla, Sweden. And we do the show there. And he's having some issues. Like, and I think, I think that show, he sat down. First time ever. But that he sat down to do a show with the band. And so, because he just can't stand up for that long because his hip is killing him. And uh, and then we do Oslo. Same thing, he has to sit. And then we go to Paris. And the reason we go to Paris is because John had never played Paris and he wanted to play Paris. And because he was John... You know, it was the that was a money losing operation right there. Um, so he puts this up. There's a um, in order to get the day in Paris, we have like five days off in Paris. You know, I flew my wife over. It's like okay, I got some days off in Paris in and in, in February, and it was uh, it was cool. We had a good time, but in the meantime, John's dealing with his hip. And so he gets on a conference call with the doctors and they say, OK, you have to come home. We have to do this now. Like, you can't continue the tour. You have to get this taken care of. So we're in Paris. So we do the show in Paris and it's a club show. It was, um, you know, which was rare. Every once in a while we do someplace because John never played Paris. He didn't have any kind of following there. But it was sold out, you know, but, and it was, it was cool. I remember Elliot Easton was there from the Cars, which, you know, I grew up around Boston. I saw the Cars the week before their first record came out. Not to, yeah, it, it's like blew my mind. I'd never seen a band that sounded like that. Skinny ties and stuff. Nobody was, you know. <laughs> anyway, but I get to be, I just remember Elliot was there. And um, so we do the show... And then um, I think John might have flown back the next day. We had one more day be just because of the way flights were and then flew back. But that was the last show. So uh, John came back and got the hip replacement. And um, that all went well, I think. You know, I'd, I'd seen John's brother, Billy, and John, and he said, yeah, he goes, I had lunch with John. And, you know, it's going good. It says, yeah, recovery going great. You know, so he gets the hip replacement. It's all, it's all good. But that's why we ended the tour. But that was um, maybe the 13th of February was the last big. Maybe we flew home on the 15th. And so this COVID, you know, in Europe at this point, you know, but it's still not everywhere, you know, like it was, um, there was a concern about it, but not that, not that big a concern. We're playing a club, you know, we're playing a show. So we come back, hey, John has a surgery, everything's fine, and um, recovery's going good. And then uh, I remember the tornado came through East Nashville. I just remember my daughter was going to Lachlan Elementary and so it, 
the tornado hit that corner of the school. So they don't have school. Then they go back for school for one day. Then it's spring break. And, and we went down to Florida. But that's when, when we were down there was when they shut everything down. And it was when I was standing in the driveway there uh, that I found out John had COVID. And it was like, okay, I don't think I can take it. Like it was, I was already in a really dark place. <laughs> like it was, it was, that, that was a really rough time. Anyway, so I found out John had COVID and we all knew that that was not, you know, like if John got COVID, we knew that that was going to be bad because he'd had lung, you know, he'd had lung cancer, which they caught really early. So this is not good. And this was so early on. I mean, they didn't have any, they didn't know what, what to do, really, you know. The last time I saw him was the night of the gig in Paris. How did you hear about his passing? Uh, Mitchell called me, our tour manager. So, and I know where I was. I just was out on my sidewalk outside. It was a full moon. I remember thinking, John likes full moon. You know, like, I think, thinking, you know, he could pull through. Because there was that thing, you know, he was, we knew he was on the ventilator, but he'd pulled through so many times, you know, with the cancer and, and stuff. And, and he would bounce back. And there was just the hope that, you know, he might bounce back. He might be able to pull through. Like, and it went on for a few days, like where it's like, well, he made it through another day. But, you know, he did, didn't make it. So, yeah, that's where I was, just standing on my sidewalk in front of my house, looking at the full moon when the phone rang and I looked who it was and I thought, this is not good news. Yeah. 